Did, did anybody remember buying your first car? That was a big experience for me. I, I, I had my hope on this Jeep. I mean, I'm like, I wanted this Jeep. I desperately wanted to buy a Jeep. And I was talking to the salesman. I had finally negotiated a price that I felt like I could afford. afford. It was more than I wanted to pay, but it was worth it to me. I wanted the Jeep. And as soon as I agreed that I would buy it, the first thing he wanted to do was sell me an extended service policy. And in my head, I'm like, so you're telling me this thing's going to break. <laughs> you're going to tell me that sooner or later, I'm going to wish I didn't have this thing. Well, ladies and gentlemen, here's the thing. The, the things of this world almost never actually live up to the billing. They, they, the hopes and the dreams that you invest so much in things uh, just don't ever seem to meet the expectations and, and, and it's not just for stuff. I mean, stuff we know decays, gets old, it breaks, it loses its, its uh, shine. But there are other things in this life as well that quite often just don't live up to what we had hoped they would be. The achievements that we make in life, the accomplishments, the relationships that we pour so much into and we have so much hope for. And what we discover is that anticipation, expectation, often these things don't line up with the reality of life. Well, over the last several months, we've been studying Paul's letter to the Romans. And I've been telling you that I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Doesn't matter who you are, churchgoer, non-churchgoer, Jewish, Gentile, doesn't matter what your background is, God's power is exhibited through the gospel. It's what rescues us for salvation. We're not ashamed of that. Paul's the one who wrote that in, first, uh, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And during our study of this book, this anticipation for the good news has been building. I mean, I don't know about you, but Paul sort of started out by telling us, oh, the gospel's awesome, but then he started telling us about bad news. The word gospel means good news, and I'm like, where's the good news? All this bad news is just so overwhelming. I mean, we're broken by sin, and, and we can't really rescue ourselves. And so Jesus came, and by faith, in the obedience of faith, we have been rescued. Paul finally got to the good news. It's been so exciting. And so the question we now are in this section of the letter where Paul's really exploring now all the joy of the gospel. And the question that I want to ask you today is, is does the gospel live up to its promise? I mean, is this really good news? I mean, it promises forgiveness of sins eternally and relationship with God and this eternal inheritance. And we look at those things and we think, okay, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. All of that is sort of future stuff. But what about now? I mean, this in this world, all those promises seem a little bit distant. And when we take a look around and we see the world in which we live, we, we might tend to wonder, are we missing something? So today we're going to turn a page, so to speak. We're going to move into the next chapter, chapter 5. Uh, Paul's going to make the case that, yes, there's this future benefit that is coming that is glorious, but being justified by faith has very real and tangible benefits right now here in this world. And so what we're about to read are some of the most encouraging, comforting words that, that Christians can ever hear. I hope you'll have your Bibles open to Romans chapter 5 today. We're going to work through these great verses, and today we're just going to take a little bit of an overview at what Paul's saying here, and then we're going to go back into more detail uh, in, the, in the weeks to come. But let's pray before we get into the text today and ask the Lord to bless us and meet us here, okay? Lord, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the gospel. We thank you that we have been justified by faith. Because of Jesus, we are made right. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your work on the cross. And now we speak of this good news today as Paul delivered to us, as you, Holy Spirit, has spoken to us through Paul. We pray now that you'll help us to see the word of God and to dwell in this richly and let it dwell in us richly as we understand uh, this place in the world that we inhabit today uh, and the good news uh, that is a part of our lives. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's, uh, let's pick up in verse number one. We're going to read the first 11 verses in Romans. Uh, and I just, like I said, just want to sort of walk you through these today uh, and just look at just this overview of, of how our faith triumphs uh, in life. So verse number one, therefore... Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope 
of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Sometimes some big words in there. We've talked about a lot of those in this series, and, and you understand most of them, and we'll explain some more later. You know, it's sort of funny when I read through these verses here. I have to resist the urge to read them as if I'm in a TV infomercial. <laughs> because it's like, I mean, it's like, you know, for 1995, you get the slicer, the dicer, the julienne knife, but wait, there's more. I mean, it's sort of like, it's like this passage is filled with this, this, this device here where Paul is like building layer upon layer of blessings and benefits that come to us because of the gospel. So before you, you, before you get that in your mind too much, I want to be careful here because because we know that in this world there's a lot of hype that doesn't match the reality. But in these verses, we, not, we don't find hype. We find this hope that grows layer upon layer upon layer. There's no catch to what he's saying here because our justification, in, in our justification, in our salvation, in being made right with God, we end up receiving more than we expected. More for the future, more for now. And so we want to talk about this today. Early on in Romans, Paul took a lot of time to develop the bad news. And, and, and I don't know about you, but over those few weeks where we were reading in chapters 1, 2, and 3, it sort of sometimes almost felt like this relentless assault about, about the law and sin and how desperate our situation is. Well, Paul now is going to expand on the good news in such a magnificent, powerful way through the rest of this letter that we're going to understand that that bad news that told us we're broken beyond repair is nothing compared to the glorious good news that comes through the obedience of faith. That being made right with God that happens in our faith in Jesus Christ has benefit for us, not just in eternity, but right now in this life. Because honestly, if all we get out of justification is God's judgment and the future in heaven, that'd be enough for me, Right? That'd be enough. If I, if I knew that being a Christian, that the only thing it did for me was giving me my ticket to heaven and that I don't have to go to hell, I'm going to be okay with that. But Paul says there is so much more. And this was important. This was important for people to understand who are living in a world that was in so much turmoil. Listen, you think the turmoil of this past week and of the world in which we live is something. The days that Paul lived and the days that of the Christian's to whom Paul was writing this letter, were, were filled with absolute turmoil all the time. Roman Empire kind of stuff. Stuff that was just d destroying the lives of Christians left and right. And so he's writing to these people and he wants them to understand that, listen, in Christ there are amazing benefits that are not only for your future but for right now. In the midst of all this. The first thing that he tells them is, is that they have peace with God. Look at verse number one. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's important for you to notice here that Paul's very specific about the kind of peace he's talking about here. He says this is peace with God that is different than the peace of God that we read about in other places in the scriptures. I mean, for instance, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, it says that we can have the peace of God which gives us this inner tranquility that we need in the midst of all the turmoil that's going on around us. And so the peace of God is really, really important, really significant. For instance, this past week, how many of you prayed for the peace of God in your life? I hope you did. 
If you didn't, why not? Because I'm telling you, this past week has been a week filled with news that's just not been enjoyable at all to watch. And, and it was just filled with all kinds of turmoil. And Philippians chapter 4 says that we should not be anxious about anything, but with everything, bathe it, cover it in prayer, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. I, I'm sorry to say that a lot of Christians I know have been living with anxiety and worry over things you're watching in the news. And my question is, is why does not the Bible teach you that God wants to give you peace in the midst of all this? Listen, I, I worry about things. I, I, I worry about things. And, but every time that I'm finding myself in this place of worry, when I remember that God wants to give me peace, I just I speak to him and I say, God, I need peace here. And he provides that. And I think it's a miracle sometimes considering some of the circumstances that we pass through in our lives. So the peace of God is significant and beautiful, but that's not what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about having peace with God. That's a different kind of peace because that kind of peace, do you understand what that means? It means that there was a time when God was my enemy. This is military type talk right here, having peace with God. Preacher, are you telling me that God can be my enemy? Yes, I'm telling you that. Well, let me put it this way, maybe a little bit easier to understand. Uh, so I don't know that, uh, well, there are passages that tell us that God opposes us and is our enemy, but, but the way the scriptures put it is, is that we are God's enemy. And if we are the enemies of God, then he opposes us. So yes, those who are alienated from God are showing hostility toward him and God will ultimately judge those who die in their sins and are not reconciled to him. Colossians chapter 1, very important passage speaking about the glory of this magnificent incarnation of Jesus and who he is and why he came. And It says that God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. And this includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies. Notice the same language as Romans 5. You were separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he's reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result, he's brought you into his own presence. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. See, this is the consistent message of scriptures. And Paul speaks often of this idea that we were his enemies and that Christ has reconciled us. Back in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, Paul told us that the wrath of God is being poured out on all unrighteousness. In chapter 2, verse 5, he wrote that God is storing up his wrath for the day when his righteous judgments will be poured out. And right here, even in these verses, verse number 9, he says that we've been saved from a day when his wrath will come on his enemies. So ladies and gentlemen, you need to get this. It's the teaching of Scripture, and if you have not seen this, God loves the world, but he judges sin, and his judgments are always righteous. And so if you're not justified by faith in Jesus, you're an enemy of God. So think about this benefit of salvation. The, the, the truce was called and the peace treaty was signed and you are no longer at war with God because you have peace with God right now, this moment. Oh, how important is this? Because ladies and gentlemen, God opposes the proud. James said in verse number, uh, chapter 4, verse 6, that that God opposes the proud, uh, resists the proud, but he gives grace to those who are humble. James was quoting from an Old Testament passage that Solomon in Proverbs chapter 3 said that God puts a curse on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. Now, does that sound a little bit maybe like Abraham, who has been a big part of our Romans journey here? God I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. So God had stated from the earliest days that that, that there's blessings that come on the house of those who are righteous, and our righteousness can only be found in Christ. And there is a curse on the house of the wicked, and because their righteousness is not good enough. And then Solomon continued in the same chapter. He said, God mocks the mocker, but gives grace to the humble. I mean, can you possibly conceive of what it would look like to have God opposing you? In the early service, uh, I used this illustration, and we had, um, well, here's Willow. Hey, Willow. Wait. There's Willow. Can stand up, Willow. Stand up so people can see you. Willow. Willow Price. She's the youngest daughter of a, 
of Ben and Liz. Okay, thanks. You can sit down. Sorry to embarrass you there. <laughs> Willow's a sweetheart, but I, I've got her by about 100 pounds or more. <laughs> now, um, this, uh, this door over here uh, pushes out. So let's just say Willow's in here and I'm on the other side of the door. If I want Willow to not be able to get to that door, do you think I can stop her? Yeah. Hey, I mean, we've all done the trick, right? You can put your foot up against the door and really not even exert a lot of effort. Just, you just my weight would do that. Now, now suppose that it's not just me, but suppose her dad and Ron and Evan and, and Brian and we get about 10 guys out there and we stand on the outside of that door and we don't want Willow to come through. Is she getting through that door? Uh, and now suppose this. Suppose you've got God on the other side of the door and he doesn't want you to come through. You're definitely not. That's right. Thank you. You're definitely not getting through that door, are you? You, you see, see, God is at war against sin. And his judgments are right and true always. And we, without faith, are his enemy. And so you go back here to Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says that even though we were sinners, Christ still came to us. You've got to get this. This is important in Romans. We were helpless to come to him, so he came to us. Christ died for us even when we were at our most unlovable. Even when we were his enemies, God loved us anyway. And so this benefit of justification is profound and is meaningful, not just for eternity, but for right now. Because how many times have you been paying attention to the news and you have seen that in this world there are voices that are in opposition to God. And you and by the way, that's not a political statement. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on, it's all ugly, right? And God opposes the pride of humanity. And I don't want to be on that side of the door. Hallelujah. Jesus has rescued me and given me peace with God. And what that means is, is that God now deals graciously with those whom he has justified. Listen, I'll have, I'll have eternity in heaven with God, but on this side of heaven, I know now that the hostility has ceased. That I can breathe a sigh of relief, that the war with God is over and peace has been declared in my heart. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Now get this, not only that, but... Verse number two says, we're standing now in grace. Look at look what he says here. Through him, we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. That's going to demand a whole sermon in itself next week. But can I just tell you that we have the right to stand in the presence of God. Not because we're all that, but because of grace. Man, hallelujah. This, this morning in the early service, it was so cute. Uh, Evan was up here playing, and uh, his son, Aeneas, who is, how old is Aeneas, what, three, four, uh, came up here and stood next to his daddy, and it was really pretty cool, and on the particular song that they were doing, uh, Stacy was singing, uh, Evan gave Aeneas a dead microphone that wasn't doing anything, so he's just standing there with a the microphone, and, and I thought, you know what, that little boy walked into the presence of his dad with no fear. I mean, there was a congregation full of people here. He didn't care about anybody else. He knew he was safe going to his dad. It's awesome. It's a beautiful picture. Is, gra is, is there a better word in the English language than grace? I mean, it, we stand in grace. We stand in the favor of God that we did not earn, we do not deserve. That's what grace is. What a huge blessing this is. Because, see, before our salvation, what we learn, and the reason why Paul took so much time to develop this is, is that, that if our life is based on the law, then God must deal with us on the basis of the law. We must be judged for sin. We stand under the judgment. And it doesn't matter whether you know the law or not. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. The law always applies. How many of you have ever been driving down the road and the blue lights come on behind you and the officer says, says, uh, says you were doing 51 and a 35 and you're like, oh, I didn't know it was 35. Uh. <laughs> I don't know about you. Maybe, maybe you were able to convince the officer to show some grace. I know about me. I had to pay a ticket. I didn't know. 
Well, see, here's the thing. that If, you're, if you are judging your life on the basis of the law, on your good works, then you must suffer the consequences of what the law demands. But since our justification is accomplished by Jesus, God can now deal with us in grace in spite of our sin. That enables God to bless people who are worthy of death and who deserved judgment. Because justification, this, this word justification, that we have been made just right with God, we are right with Him, it gives us this place of standing and security. As one preacher put it, there is no iffiness about where we stand before God. If you're a Christian, you stand before Him in grace. Only by grace. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul's also writing that letter to Christians who were really struggling with uh, their relationship with God. And he says that any man who's in Christ, he is a what? He's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And I've struggled with that verse over the years because I look at my life and I'm like, man, I still sin. I still mess up. You know, if everything's all new, what's happening here? Well, what he's saying there is, is that everything is new for us because we are no longer judged by what we have done. We are judged by what Christ has done. Amen. That's powerful. So all of our sins have passed away. Uh, we're, they're under the blood of Jesus and God considers them against us no more. And get this, this idea behind standing in grace, the idea here is that this is an accomplished fact. This is not something that's subject to debate. It's a standing. It's always standing. It's always established. This is our identity. Listen, you come and ask me, who are you? And I can tell you a thousand things about who I am. I can tell you I'm a husband, a father, a grandfather. I can tell you I, I fight fires with the fire department and I'm a chaplain with the fire department and local law enforcement. I can tell you that, that I, I grew up in Georgia and I'm a Georgia Bulldog fan. Go dogs! I can also tell you that there's lots of things I can tell you about me. And if you hang around with me, you'll discover all that stuff. But can I tell you there is nothing more important about who I am than this. I am in Christ. And he has rescued me. Nothing more. That, that's my true and real and only eternal identity. And we need to get a hold of this. We need to understand what it means that we have been called into the presence of God and we have access by grace. This is beautiful. Doesn't mean we're finally perfected now, but it does mean that the same grace that gives me the right to stand before God in eternity is the same grace that gives me the right to stand before God now. He's continuing to work in my life. In this broken, messed up life that I still live. He gives me forgiveness, encouragement, mercy. All because of faith. All because of grace. Hallelujah. Notice that he's not done. There's more. He says, we rejoice also, verse 2, in the hope of the glory of God. You know, it's, it's glorious that we're no longer held and judgment for our sins, but it's even more glorious that we have this hope that will never fade away. See, this is a benefit that is, that is now and very tangible and real. This is the kind of hope that must be God-produced and not man-produced. So all those things that I desperately wanted for Christmas, they're, they're gone. All the promises made by people that they weren't able to keep... All the human-centered expectations of life that end up failing me, none of that lasts. None of that produces the kind of joy that I have and the hope that comes with the glory of God. And this is going to be one of the big themes now that we need to, that it needs to be revealed over and over again. And Paul has said this more than once already, but ladies and gentlemen, I just want to tell you, if you never remember anything else about, about this message, remember this. God is glorious. He is glorious. This is not just a theme of Romans. This is the theme of the Bible. David said, The glory of God thunders, and the Lord is over many waters. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. The apostle John saw the new heavens and the new earth, and he spoke of this new city. He said that it will have no need of the sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God illuminates it, and its lamp is the Lamb. Habakkuk, the Old Testament prophet, said that God's radiance is like the sunlight and the rays flashing from his hands. 
In Isaiah chapter 6, he spoke of having a vision of God and he said that I saw the Lord and he was sitting on a lofty throne and the train of his robe filled the temple and there were mighty seraphim with him, all of them having six wings and two wings they covered their faces, two wings they covered their feet, two they were flying and they were calling out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory and their voices shook the temple to its foundations. And the entire building was filled with smoke. And Isaiah said, I'm a dead man in the presence of such glory. When Isaiah got a vision of God, he realized his own humanity. He realized his smallness. He realized his sinfulness. And it took an act of God to rescue him from that moment. When God sent an angel to cleanse him and forgave him. See, Isaiah was able to stand by grace. In the presence of God. C.S. Lewis wrote that a man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of his cell. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this paradise that we lost, Eden, will be restored. And we know God's glory, and it will not terrify us. And so now Paul brings us back from that heavenly precipice, and he reminds us that life is still hard. The glory of God shines, and those who see it know it and understand it, and we stand in his presence and fall on our feet at the same time, or fall on our faces at the same time. But he says the benefits of justification aren't done because in the next few verses, he says that in addition to these other things, we also can right now in this life rejoice in our trials. Because life is hard. And, and, and so our salvation speaks to us more than just future tense. It's speaking to us right now in present tense. Yes, there's a glorious future for us, but God's glory shines now because of how this hope shines now. And that's why Paul says we can rejoice in our sufferings, verse 3, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. In some translations it says that hope will not disappoint you. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Get this. God's love is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. By the way, you never see the word Trinity in the Scriptures, but right here you see the Trinity, right? Father, Son, and Spirit all show up here in the same passage. Now listen, you know, just like a, a TV salesman, there are some religious salesmen today who will promise you peace and prosperity and health and wealth if you're a Christian. And that kind of message is completely and absolutely foreign from the mind of Christ and the apostles. They never spoke of that. Jesus said in Matthew 13 that trials will come. In John chapter 16, he said, in this life you will have tribulation. In Acts chapter 14, Paul said that we must all go through many hardships... Uh, before we enter the kingdom of God. In Hebrews chapter 10, the writer says that there are some people who will go through public trials and others will stand beside them while they do. In other words, you may not be going through a trial, but you know people who are and you stand with them. This is the life we now live. This is the world in which we are. There will be tribulation in this world. There's no place in the scripture that says that if you trust in Jesus, all your wildest dreams will come true. And if that's your anticipation and expectation that right here in this life that troubles will be gone and that problems will diminish and that you'll be wealthy and you'll be healthy, you are wrong and teachers who teach that are false teachers. You see, we, we hardly need to be convinced, however, that we should rejoice in the good times. It's easy to rejoice in the times of peace and prosperity. But what Paul wants to do is establish the fact that Christians can and should have joy and boast even in the midst of their tribulations. But you know what? We need proof of that, don't we? And so he provides it right here in this passage. He gives us a couple of very profound arguments. The first is, is that we're able to boast in our trials because trials actually produce in us a visible evidence of God working in us. God's changing us. Remember, we're this new creation, and so he's doing something in us, and so therefore trials serve to produce endurance for us. And by the way, sometimes your translations say patience there, but I think endurance is a better picture there because the idea here is, is that we are in this for the long haul. 
And, and sometimes we celebrate the, the short term victories and hallelujah for that. But we're not done. You've gone through a serious trial. Can I just tell you, you're not done yet. Life will still give reasons for you to trust in Jesus. And so endurance is important. Endurance, therefore, will produce in us a character. Character that reveals God and his priorities and his, his law and his righteousness. And by the way, the, the argument that Paul's going to end up making here is, is that those who are in Christ live according to the law. They actually live the law that judges us and condemns us. We actually do those good things that we're called to do because we're believers. In, in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, it says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto or to do good works. Christ rescued us and saved us so that we will live righteously. This is huge. Well, enduring in the midst of trials produces the kind of character that enables that to happen. It teaches us that God stays with us. I was having a conversation yesterday with a guy who had uh, Peter Hale. Some of you remember Peter, at least a crazy student who was here for several years and he's gone on and he got married and uh, about a year and a half ago his wife was in a terrible, terrible car accident. She almost died. They, they told her as she went into surgery after the accident that they weren't sure if she was going to survive. She did survive. They told her that she had broken her femur and her other leg and her hip and her neck and her shoulder and that she, that she would have years of rehab and would never regain the kind of a place that she had been in. And nine months later she was walking and back to life. And she's doing well today. Now he told me this yesterday as I was talking to him, just sort of catching up. First time I've seen him since all that happened. And he said, we wouldn't, change, we wouldn't trade one moment of it. He said, we didn't want it. I wouldn't want her to ever have to go through it again. But we wouldn't trade a moment of it because we, we, we've learned about God. We've learned stuff about him. See, endurance produces character. And get this, character produces hope. See, hope helps us to set our minds on something that's not here. To set our minds on something that's eternal and yet unfulfilled. Hope is what Abraham had all those years when for, for 25 years God's making a promise and he's not seeing it fulfilled. Hope is what enabled him to keep on going because the character of God had been produced in him. And when he had God's character in him, he was willing to trust. So we can boast in our trials because trials produce these visible evidences of God working in us. But also we can boast in our trials because it allows the evidences of the Holy Spirit to work through us. Listen, the Holy Spirit starts showing up in us when we are going through these trials. And can I just tell you, too many people in this room think you've got the Holy Spirit figured out. Including me. And I think that's the reason why it's so important here where it says that hope does not put us to shame. Some translations say it doesn't lead us to disappointment. Why? Because we, what we discover in these trials is how much God really does love us. And what that means to have the Holy Spirit who's filling our hearts with love. Listen, this is critical. People who have the Holy Spirit are people who love. Okay? That's the reason why Jesus said there's the greatest commandment. Remember the greatest commandment? The most important thing you should be doing is what? To love God and love people. Right? The second commandment is like the first. If, you're, if you are struggling with love, can I just tell you? You, you, need, to, you need to understand if the Holy Spirit is in you, that's what God's trying to do, and He's trying to let that show, that love show through you to God and to others. And you know what's amazing to me is, is that sometimes the best way for our love to find its expression is in the middle of trials. Isn't that something? When life, when, when you feel hurt and depressed and, and discouraged, and you feel like life is caving in around you, that's the moment when you need to really focus on love. On God's love for you, on you loving God and you loving others. When people go through trials, when people go through testings, and when people find their lives caving in, that's when God's people need to show the Holy Spirit is in them and we need to love. And so, in a sense, what Paul's writing here is that God is changing us, but he's also changing others through us because the Holy Spirit is in us. And so the argument is sort of simple. As we go through trials, we end up gaining confidence in God. We become more and more amazed at how he's working in us. And these trials begin to reveal his character through us. And God's love starts showing up for others through us. 
And, and, and I'm just going to be honest with you, that's the reason why when we have a week like the week we've just concluded, when some people feel like they're breathing a sigh of relief today and other people across the country are like terrified about what the future holds, these, these are the moments, ladies and gentlemen, when we need to understand what love looks like in our world. I think there's a reason why so many of the stories that come out of Christianity happen in the midst of trials. And I'm fairly certain that one of the one of the things that has held American Christianity back is our relentless pursuit of comfort. I mean, it's just, it feels like it's just in our American DNA to want things to be peaceful, to want things to be, to, to be good, and to win. Everything. We want life to be safe. Oh, we're willing to work hard. We'll sweat and cry and invest, but we want to reap the rewards of the efforts of our hard labor. And we end up becoming very protective of it. But I got a question for you. What if our lack of commitment to Christ could be traced back to the things that we might call blessings? Is that possible? What if the reason we don't see big movements of the Holy Spirit anymore is because we think we have them all figured out? And we believe that His biggest desire for us is happiness and peace and prosperity and health. I got a letter this week. It's interesting that I got it this week in the midst of reading this passage uh, from Sonny. You all remember Sonny, Durrell's friend from China who was here a while back? By the way, Sonny's not his real name. He's a Chinese Christian. That's an American name that he's adopted. But uh, he came to the United States to study. He got his Master's of Divinity from Fuller Theological Seminary. And he's been praying about how can I help the Chinese church learn how to do missions well, to do missions right. So for the last several months, he's been in the Middle East working with some teams there trying to discover what it looks like to be on the mission field. And he's finally decided that there is a place that he's going. And I want you to listen to this letter that he wrote to me. He said, I've decided to join an international team going to this Middle Eastern country. He didn't name the country. And he says, please forgive me for not posting pictures or mentioning important details of the field where I'm going to because the persecution in China is escalating. When you send an email, if you live in China and you send an email out, you can guarantee that it passes through somebody who reads it, right? So he says, some churches have already been shut down. However, most Christians here believe that persecution will bring greater revival. Now, those of you who met Sonny, you remember a little, a little bit about his passion. But I want to remind you that he's leaving one place where persecution is already increasing so he can go to another place where persecution is already worse. All because he knows who he belongs to. And he knows that he's standing before God in his grace. And so when grace does its work in your life, you can look at times of tribulation in a completely different light. And the reason that our hope doesn't disappoint us is because God's character is ultimately revealed in us. And there's so much more that we can say about these verses, and we will in future times, but I just want to draw your attention as we close today back to verses number 7 and 8. Speaking about this, this hope that what God's doing in us and about how Christ died for the ungodly, it says, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, those anticipation expectations that we have, for people who have lived all of their lives under the law, got to do this, i got to do that, i got to be good, i got to be go to church, i got to do this and that. For people who live under the law, when they take inventory of their life, and they pay attention to how they've lived, no matter how good they have been, there's always, always going to be uncertainty about their eternal destiny. I remember my father giving his testimony. My, my, uh, my dad grew up in church from the time he was in second grade all the way through the, the end of his life, uh, he went to church religiously. Um, my mom and dad got married, and they moved to Atlanta, Georgia. And one of the first things they did in Atlanta was they found a church to attend, and they attended religiously. I'm the oldest boy of, of uh, four, born in October the 28th. Write it down. They wanted to make sure... <laughs> that I went to church religiously, and so we did. Every time the doors were opened, I was at church. 
But one day, my mom and dad met a couple who had served as missionaries in Ecuador. They were semi-retired. They were going to this church. They were living back here in the States. They started a Bible study. Mom and dad started attending. And soon they began to learn about the grace and the glory of God. Now, very soon after that, my mom became a Christian. Two years later, my dad became a Christian. Now, as my parents began to grow in their faith, they began to look for ways to serve God. And my dad met some people who were with an organization called the Gideons. And most of you know the Gideons. They put the Bibles in hotels and hospitals and, and used to do that in schools, military editions, things like that. My dad became a member of the Gideons. It's an organization for Christian businessmen who, want, who love God's Word and want to get that out. So uh, as a member of the Gideons, he would travel occasionally and go to other churches. And when he was there, he would talk about the Gideons, but he would always use his testimony as a way to talk about how his life had been changed because ultimately his life was changed because the Word of God came to him. I'll never forget listening to my dad describe his experience. He talked about being a churchgoer, a religious churchgoer. He attended religiously. It was a big part of his testimony. He was one of the good ones. I mean, he was, you know, he was faithful to his wife. He loved his kids. He was an honest businessman, a good neighbor. But as he told his testimony, he talked about how that his picture of religion sort of worked like, like, like this, that in order to have a relationship with God, I had to make sure that the that the great scales of heaven were always balanced in his favor. That he had to do enough good deeds to outweigh his bad deeds, and that if he would do that, he would ultimately find favor with God. The problem was, he began to realize what it means that God's holy. And that even his little indiscretions were so weighty that they demanded the ultimate judgment of God. And he concluded that no amount of good deeds would ever outweigh his bad deeds. And for a while, it drove him to despair. And I told you he became a Christian two years after my mom. Those two years were tough for my dad. Because my mom's passion for him to become a believer in his mind was nothing more than self-righteousness. I'm a good person, he would say. I'm going to heaven. Look at my, record, my track record. I've, I've been in church all my life. But what finally broke through for my dad was when he realized that salvation isn't achieved through self-righteousness. It is only achieved through Christ's righteousness. Amen. And this is the beauty of Romans, and it's the beauty of the good news, is that in our own righteousness, our self-righteousness will never qualify us to stand before God. And because of grace, we have been saved. Because of faith in Jesus Christ and God's great riches of mercy and love for us, we stand now in this grace that gives us this relationship with God. And ladies and gentlemen, that is a benefit today as well as tomorrow. Let me ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning as we close this service. I never, I never assume that everybody here is a follower of Jesus. I think it's always possible that somebody who's been under the sound of my voice and who's heard the word of God is here today and who has not settled in their heart whether or not they know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Maybe you've been a really religious person, a good person, salt of the earth, and somebody who people would look at and be surprised if you ever had to stand up and say, you know, I've never trusted Jesus, and so therefore I am not a new creation. But don't let your pride stand between you and the other side of the door. Because God will stand at that door and keep it closed if you don't relinquish your pride in Him. <clears throat> Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. As we sing this morning, I invite you to come. You come and trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you need to come for another reason, just to confess sin as a Christian, or you just want to come and pray, you're welcome to do that. Please do that. But while we sing today, we're going to stand amazed in the presence of God. And so let's give God the glory with our lives.